Hello, I'm Gary Rhodes from Brigham Young University in the Merritt School of Management. Welcome to the Entrepreneur Lecture Series. Today, we're very pleased to welcome Duke Cowley. Upon graduating from Arizona State University, Duke worked in his father's business for two years and then returned to the Phoenix area to manage a multinational water pump manufacturing company. In 1966, the Cowleys started their own well drilling and water pump and supply business. In 1968, Duke began a self-service gas and car wash business with two partners. Today has expanded into 25 gas stations, sea stores, and restaurants. His family currently owns and manages industrial warehouses in Phoenix. Duke and his wife Alice have three children. The Rollins Center of Entrepreneurship and Technology welcomes Duke Cowley to the Entrepreneur Lecture Series. Thank yeah, you so much. Thank you very much. You're coming. And Gary, before you start, I'll give any one of the first young ladies here $20 if they can tell me what the feminine word is for entrepreneur. No one wants your money. My wife says it's boss lady. <laughs> But it actually comes from the French stem, and it's entrepreneurus. If you go back to an old, old dictionary, it'll be there. So you were, you were raised and born in a family that's very entrepreneur. And even your family is that way, right? Tell us a little about that. Well, they, in those days, they didn't call them entrepreneurs. They were self-made businessmen. Okay. And so uh, my, my family has... Uh, for the majority of my life has lived in a small town up in eastern Arizona called St. John's. A population of about 1900 when I went to school we had 139 students I think in the high school. Actually we had the great privilege in that high school of being in the school while I was there. Rex Lee who's the former president of BYU and Eric Shumway who's the former yeah. president of of BYU Hawaii so, so out of a school that size uh, we have two at least two famous people well, was something in that water or something in there? yeah there's a lot in the water <laughs> <laughs> and there isn't much water yeah. <laughs> so but you uh, uh, your your family and, and was very entrepreneur or uh, self-made business people right my, I mean yes my my family my grandfather was in the water well drilling business and uh, then his two boys, two, two of his boys formed a partnership uh, back in the early, uh, the late 30s and started their own business in, in the water well drilling business. And as th those were difficult times and hard to make a living, uh, particularly up through the end of World War II and the early 50s. In the early 50s, my family started doing contracting work on the Navajo Indian Reservation for the government drilling wells and, and it became a fairly lucrative good good business. Did you learn that? I mean did you start many of your businesses and that and in, uh, after college at Arizona State or did you do this before and tell us a little about that. Well I, I, I worked there and my dad uh, threatened me if I became a well driller. <laughs> <laughs> uh, if you can picture this, why most of the most of the well drilling help were not of the uh, well. They're not were, they weren't the kind of guys you are. I hope most of them drank like fish and swore like sailors and some and worse. Uh, and so he he decided that I should. Uh, that he didn't want me to go to the well well rig all the time, but I was the mechanic on on the machinery. Oh, and okay. Uh, my dad wasn't very patient, uh, and he would tell me to go do something, and I, I didn't know what part he told me to go fix, the name of it, when I was in high school. And so, but he hired a, a, an elderly fellow that was just a master mechanic and could fix almost anything. Uh, the, he swore like a trooper, and I had to learn to watch my language. My father, incidentally, is not a member of the church, um, and so... Uh, I grew up with one foot in, one foot out, and but I, I learned the principles of work, and if, and then after I graduated from, from and this was all before college, so you were this is all before college. Okay. Uh, I, I went to the University of Arizona, okay, for three years, spent three or two and a half years in the engineering school, 
there and another couple of semesters in engineering at U of A and ended up with a degree in math education oh. and hung it on the wall and said, I'm, I'm going to work for myself or, and worked a couple of years with my dad and his brother. Uh, I was smart enough to run the whole place if they wanted to go someplace and when I got back, when they got back I had to get instructions on how to sweep the floor. So uh, <laughs> we, and I married uh, Alice, my dear wife, and uh, that's been a great influence on my life. In fact, uh, my mission president, who was uh, Elder Bangeter, uh, told Alice that she was the best thing that ever happened to me. <laughs> and that's been a little tough to live with. Then, to make it even worse, one day we were having a meeting in, of the his, some of these missionaries in the Jordan Temple, and he, and he told the rest of the group from the pulpit that that was true. So it's now doctrine. <laughs> Well, and, and tell us a little about it. I mean, many entrepreneurs, you know, it, it's it's kind of a common thing. They'll say the best thing that helped them go because you were in business and and started a number of of wells and pumps, uh, comp manufacturing companies, and then you did then you branched out into stores and car washes and restaurants. Uh, was your wife a big part of that, or just uh, helping out, or how how did all that work? Well, when we started, when we started the the. Uh, uh, water well business and the water well supply business. I had worked for the supplier okay. and uh, looked around and said, hey, you know, why am I doing this for somebody else? I mean, I can do this for myself. And so that's kind of the idea that it started with. And, the, and, and when I separated from them, I had the opportunity to go to, to uh, Guadalajara, Mexico and uh, help build and run a, a CO2 plant. Okay. And that was very enticing. And then I had the opportunity to get a franchise on a good pump line. And our dis my wife had a great deal of influence because we had long discussions about having a way to provide a job and, and a place where our children could learn to work. And uh, which is not a difficult, is a kind of a difficult thing to find. In the, in, in, particularly it gets worse and worse to find a place that kids can actually work and learn a trade or how to do something. Yeah. And so that was the birth of the, the pump business and we started with a the great sum of about two thousand dollars <laughs> and, and, and the greatest help was the family name and uh, my parents and their and the business they had had always paid the bills on time and so because of that and the relationship that they had with the suppliers around I ended up starting the business basically on the their 30-day credit line with the companies Wow but again an, uh, uh, another theme is that work ethic and that I mean you put a lot of hours in in the beginning right yes in the big well in the beginning and the, uh, and the middle and the ba end? In the middle and, and, <laughs> and I quit working on Saturdays. <laughs> but my wife uh, was a great help. And, and we, when we started, she, we had the, the business line to where it would ring at the house. So if I went out and on sales or the job or whatever, and, and she, she could answer the phone and take care of the customers and did most, of the, most all of the book work. So uh, for several years before we wrenched out. What a great partnership. How did you get into um, uh, gas stations and restaurants? I mean, what expertise led you over into that? And, and tell us a little about that. Uh, it, it started on a two-fold situation. Uh, num number one, by, by that time I had been, was teaching, a, uh, I was in a Bishop Rick and, or, excuse me, and teaching a, a priest quorum. And one day I asked the young men, what do you want to be? And one of them made an interesting statement. He says, I want to make enough money that money works for me, not me working for money. Okay. Now, that, that's a, a deep, interesting subject that could last a long time. But the gasoline business came about that 
by over by the University at ASU, the, the first self-service gasoline station was started by a little company called Gasomat, and you had to hmm. put a buy, go to the window where the couple lived that rented, it, buy a slug, and go put it into the into the oh. gas pump, and you got a dollar's worth of gasoline. I remember buying gas that way. Okay, and that was and and that was. And and I thought, well, this is you know a unique idea. And besides being a penny pincher, where we gassed there, and one day when I when I was there, a lady drove up in a Lincoln, which was the finest car you could buy in those days, yeah. <laughs> in a fur coat, got out and pumped her own gas. And I said, well, if this is going to happen, this is this is going to be the future. And so. There were in the pump business. I was involved with actually with Rex Mon, who's had a great deal to do with right. the uh, BYU TV. Had a car wash that the pumps wouldn't work, and they, they had had a lot of trouble with the pumps. And so they came to me to get them get the pumps work system worked out for them. And in the end, I ended up buying the car wash. And so uh, then we enclosed one of the the booths, and and put gas pumps in front of it and had a couple live there. We thought that we would that we would utilize the university students where so they could as a couple, a married couple, they could exchange time and okay. and go to school at the same time. It worked out both that way and elderly couples that were semi retired and didn't have enough money on their retirement so it became a, a good source of labor. The second one we we opened it was interesting because the city of Tempe uh, the, the wouldn't give us a permit, and because they said that it was dangerous for self-serve gasoline, <coughs> and I, and I said, well, I've researched all of the the rules and regulations, and I can't find anything that says you can't have a self-service uh, service station, and they said, well, you know, the fire chief says we don't want it. I said, well, let's go up and see the city attorney. And the city attorney listened to their story and looked at them and said, if you guys think I'm too dumb to pump gas, <laughs> get lost. <laughs> and so we, we, we then had a, then we, we first operated the service station self-service with, with apartment there and, and with a self-service car wash. And, and that's just grown and to C stores, right? And, and the then, stores? It, grew, okay. then it grew. The C stores were a better, easier, actually operation than the car washes, and we grew in. And then I partnered up with two other uh, friends and and business people, and we built a. We each put, we each put two thousand dollars a piece, in the pot. And uh, this this last year we did. Over three hundred million dollars in business. So, and and I don't, good I don't return on investment. We I don't have. That. Yeah, it's pretty good. <laughs> uh, I, I never argue. The one one of the partners runs it, and uh, has a couple of kids that help him run it now. And I don't ever argue with him. No, I don't think I'd argue either. No. Nope. Well, uh, looking back, so you branched out. You you've done a lot of things and. Um, and you've always worked hard. I'm glad to hear you're taking Saturdays off now for a while. Uh, tell us about um, things you've learned. I mean, uh, and, and what would you tell a lot of these aspiring entrepreneurs or people that, that want to start their own businesses? What, what kind of insights would you give them? And I know also you're, you're really strong on salesmanship. You might uh, add something on that, too. Well, to begin with, everybody in this room will in some manner or form become a, a salesman or a coach. Uh, and, and if you think about that a minute, why you're, you, you have to, no matter what you do, if you're going to do your online business that you talked about, you have to go sell the idea to somebody else. If you're going to do the service station, had to sell the idea to the city. Had, and then I had to sell, then interesting enough, a friend and I were going to do it. We, we couldn't get anybody with our financial statement to sell us a truckload of gasoline. And so I had to end up going to a, f a friend of my father's and, and finding the source of money, which he, he didn't, he 
put almost no money in it, but he went to the bank and, and signed the note, and the bank uh, wouldn't take, they, they didn't care whether my signature was on it or not, but, <laughs> but that started us out, and, and uh, within about six years, uh, I bought him out and paid him a million dollars for his share that he'd put maybe, well, he'd had more than all of his money back plus, plus the million dollars. So, uh, so it was and, worth and, 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 and that sailed me. I, I went to him and sat down and, and, and had a good, had the business plan, showed him the numbers and everything else. And he says, I don't know anything about service stations, but I know somebody that does and we'll bring him over and you can talk to him. Now, that's an interesting thing that I really learned yeah. is that if you, you can't in this day and age know everything about everything, even close. And so you have to trust and learn to trust people and find people that know and operate a, a successful business. And you can't take a business, you, you name me a business, and that business will have people that are going broke. It'll have people that are so-so and people that are making a lot of money. And, and so you, you, you better deal with people that know how, if you're gonna start a business, learn how to do it from somebody that knows how. And, and I would suggest, to, as I have to my children, go to work for somebody for a year. And, and in the business you think you'd like to be and then, then figure out how to improve it and, and, and go forth. Anyway, long, uh, that, that uh, those service stations have grown into, uh, 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 we have, a, have subways in nearly all of them. We have, a, we run about, uh, oh, I think 26 or 27 subways. Some of the subways are, are, are not with the service stations, but it, to put those businesses together has been a... Has that done really well? Done very, very, very well. I know in some of the small towns, that's where I'll usually stop when they have a subway and a gas station, because you know, you know what to expect. And, and, and we good. have found that the competition is tougher in the city than in outlying areas. So oh. we, we've tried to take off ramps on the freeway. Right, right. On, in the smaller places, and, and that's the most lucrative part of the service station business but not the highest volume. Yeah. So you, you made a good point, a couple points I want to emphasize. Number one is that um, experience counts, successful experience counts, but it doesn't have to be your own. Yeah. I mean, just, uh, you know, and I, I think that's something that resonate uh, that we as faculty also highlight to students is that often, uh, you know, it's great to find people that have been down that path that know, know the problems, know the barriers, because they can get you through them very quickly because you don't have to go experience them the hard way. And number two is that the importance of salesmanship, because you really do have to sell your ideas. And if you look at successful entrepreneurs, that's a theme that keeps coming over and over and over, that salesmanship, you know, professional salesmanship uh, really makes a difference. And if you don't got it, you got to get someone that does. Well, that, that's very true. And, but, and, and, and you, like I say, you're either a coach and you're coaching someone else to do it, or you're selling it yourself and a combination of that. And, uh, I, I was very fortunate in my life to have grown up in this smaller town where in 138, 40 students, uh, if you look at me, you would probably think I'm lying to you, but I, I played varsity football, both defense and offense, for three years. And, and my s sophomore year, I weighed 128 pounds and uh, I played, where do you think I played? I, I was left guard <laughs> and, 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 and nose, nose guard on defense. My junior year I was the center and I weighed 135 pounds and then my senior year I, I played right guard. So, uh, and, and and we also, my senior year, won the state championship in basketball. So, uh, and uh, a couple of years ago, they, or they uh, celebrated the 50th anniversary of the state championship. So and, you weren't and very nobody, nobody believed that nobody, <laughs> the guys that went, nobody believed they were even 
even played basketball. Yeah. So. So so you grew up not very competitive. Is that what you're telling us? There? Yeah. It, yeah. That's. <laughs> <laughs> And I, is that competitiveness, I mean, that wanting to win, do you think that uh, carried over into kind of uh, the companies you had? I mean, was that? I, I think everybody wants to be a winner. Yeah. And it, it's, it's, you know, it's just more fun to watch somebody that wins that you'd like. Yeah. It's more fun <laughs> to win yourself than it isn't. And if you don't think that's true, ask my wife. <laughs> I mean, so. Okay, yeah, enough said on that, okay. <laughs> um, well, tell us uh, other thoughts you might give the students on uh, starting the company. So work ethic, salesmanship, um, and use the experience of others. Leverage the experience of others, because that's, that's been very beneficial to you. I, one of the most difficult things in, that, that you face is how do you, how, how are you going to, if you're going to start your own business, how do you finance it? Okay. And so you have, to, you have to create some trust relationships you have to create a good business plan and and I have on a regular basis people come to my office and want to start a new business and and almost without exception the first problem is they're too greedy oh that's a good point yeah okay so then, explain that they want too much the, the the fellow that that I had to partner up with to get the stack gasoline station started when 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 the fellow that he brought in that knew about gas stations when he got through listening to him, he turned to me and he says, and, and to quote him, he says, oh hell, I've lost more money than that at the dice tables in Las Vegas. Why would I worry about this? And, and so, but, but he wouldn't let me draw a paycheck until the bank was paid. Oh. So, and, and it turned out to be the highest salary that I, higher than anything I ever dreamed in, but, but I continued to work at what we were working at, plus running the running the service stations you and uh, you you can leverage uh, by uh, if we're we also do a lot of real estate business and by if you sit down and and let the, an older person that's selling a piece of property understand the tax consequences of, of him carrying the paper versus taking all the money, paying taxes on it, and then trying to find a place to invest it, then that's a great place to uh, get financing, along with the fact that uh, for those who have the, the uh, intestinal fortitude for it um, and, and, and a little bit of holding power, buying real estate in the areas where the prices have dropped 60% why in, if are going to be an extremely good investment. Yeah. So um, other thoughts you might, might have for uh, students. I thought that's interesting. You made the comment, but I'd like to go deeper. Don't be greedy. In other words, some of the best relations you've have are been real win-win for each group. Is, is that your point too? A absolutely. If, if there's not winners on each side, then eventually it doesn't, doesn't work well. The, and uh, repeat the question here. Okay, on, on the win-win. It's important to have win-win and not be greedy because when you get one partner yeah. wants too much. Mo most of the people come, they, they want to they wanna sit down with you and they, they want to draw an executive salary before oh. they've ever proven their, 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 their product and yeah. their worth. And so th that just turns an investor off if you're not willing to sacrifice or put part of your money in it or, and you want somebody else to put all the money up and and then you pay yourself before it starts to earn money that just almost a no-no that's a good point because in your life you had to sacrifice to get them up right yes and you, yes and you know if someone's working that hard they're, they're going to make it succeed one way or the other so going from and it all hasn't been success. Uh, right, there's right. been about three times that I really was uh, broke, and uh, we, we, for example, in the water well business, why I went, uh, it was a 1,200 foot or hole, uh, uh, which is very deep to pump water, and I broke a cable and dropped all of it into the into the well, and and had I not been able to get it out, which took me six months. I, I would have uh, lost 
everything I had. And so there, there's been two or three of those times and, and you just buckle down and, yeah. and solve the little problems that you can solve. Uh, everybody in here probably is going to end up in a position that they know somebody or that's having, that's out of work and everything else. And to solve problems, you have to, that's the great thing about mathematics is, is that it teaches you to think and you have to decide what the problem is and what you're trying to find and, and, and what, do I, what things do I know that I can start the solution with and what do I have to go find and what tools do I need and use to get the solution. And some problems you can't solve. And so, but you better solve the ones that you can pick and solve and get those out of the way and eventually the rest of it probably will go away. Rob, thank you. Well, from uh, entrepreneurship to mission president, the skills transfer over? They transferred, they, they, they transferred over to being mission president. We were, our whole family was called uh, in 1980 to create the sixth, sixth mission in Brazil. Wow. And, and your, your dad would, I've got a, we've got a, a, a son of one of my, of, of our missionaries here with us today, <laughs> would probably, he, he probably would be one of them that would call me coach. But uh, it, we had a, we, we just had a marvelous experience uh, with missionaries and, and success and we created, we, we almost doubled the size of the church in three years where, where we were and uh, it was due to missionaries, we talk about missionaries working, uh, my missionaries got into a contest to see who could work the most hours without me knowing it and 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 one pair of missionaries got up to 100 hours of proselyting for the week and of, and then it went to 110 and then it went to 115 and and an assistant and a, another young ambitious missionary said well we're going to put this thing to bed and they came in on Monday morning and they looked like zombies <laughs> and I said where have you guys been and they said well not we haven't been to bed they, 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 they had a hundred and they had a hundred and thirty-two hours. You know that was possible. And and and, and eighty-five lessons and eight baptisms. Wow. And I said, uh, how'd you do that? So how'd you find people to teach? I mean, you're talking about working at working at one o'clock in the morning, <laughs> and two o'clock in the morning, and three o'clock in the morning, and four o'clock in the morning. Where where did, where did you go? How'd you do this? And, and, and so, and an entrepreneur, they were entrepreneurs. They have to reach, they reached out of the box. And, and they said, well, hospitals are work open 24 hours a day. <laughs> oh. <laughs> and you have a, a pretty good clientele that can't go anywhere. And they're interested. And, and, and you can get their interest. Num that was number one. Number two is in Brazil, the bus stations ran 24 hours a day. Oh. And, and lots of people at the bus stations and, uh, at night. And so they went to the bus stations. And I says, well, where else did you go? The police station. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, if you put your mind to it, uh, you can do about anything. Now, most of the missionaries today tell me that's against the rules, but so-so. I think that work ethic uh, that you brought in probably was a little catchy. Well, thanks so much uh, for the time. Let's turn over to students. I'm sure many of them have questions, and uh, you can address them at this time. How did you meet your, orig your original partner that you partnered with for the gas stations? The how did I meet him? Mm -hmm. He was in the oxygen and the settling business. He's the fellow that offered me a job after I to go to, to Guadalajara. And my father had had a long-term relationship. He, 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 was, he was not a high school graduate. After the World War II, he, he knew that there was a shortage of oxygen tanks for welding and so on and so on, and, and hospitals and all. And the beaches around the world were full of abandoned oxygen tanks. And, mm -hmm. and he went around and gathered those up and had a con he actually had a contract with one of the companies to buy them. And 
before he left because he didn't have any money and, he, and the bank gave him the money to go buy him off the beaches for five bucks a piece and, and ship him back to the United States and, and he sold him for 50 or 60 dollars a piece. And, and my father, because he didn't ha the, he didn't, the guy didn't have enough money to haul and deliver the oxygen, uh, ran a truck route as part of his business and they became very good friends and that, that was the connection. Suppose you're in a spot position with me, what would you do or what opportunities would you look for or pursue at this stage? So, you know, you're 25, good looking. <laughs> well, versus your age and better looking. Yeah, I agree. Right. Uh, you're, you know, you're taller, you're more handsome, and, you're and, 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 and have a better smile, so you're in, you're in good, good shape. Just smile a lot and have at it. But where would you go? What would you, what would you be doing? Uh, that's a very different, difficult question in, in the current economical uh, atmosphere we enjoy or disenjoy, whichever one it might be. Uh, but I will tell you that, that if you look at, the, at business and being in business for yourself, it's very difficult to uh, compete, almost impossible to compete in the manufacturing business unless you go offshore. It's almost impossible to compete in the, in the, in the retail business. Uh, in the restaurant business, the fader is the highest there is, and, and, and you've got all the chains, and so anything there's chains in, it, it's tough. And so my, my suggestion is that you look for a, some sort of a service business that's tied with, with a marketable piece of equipment or something that, has to, that takes service because they can't, they can't beat your services. It's an individual thing, and, and if you train a team, uh, why, then, then you, you, you can, you got a good game, small game. If you get to where you can, can bond for government contracts and stuff, why, there, there's a lot of really small government contracts that the big boys don't want and the little boys don't dare. And so that's my personal opinion and, and, and then the information business, the internet and, and uh, is wide, wide open. Uh, the, the biggest problem I see there is it's every day somebody invents a new and f faster mousetrap. But I think also some of the insights you gave earlier were um, Go work for someone for a year, because a lot of times you'll see opportunities, right? If you know an industry you want to work in, like the service industry or something, go work in it and then see what can be done better, right? I mean, that's... A absolutely. Absolutely. What you see what they do and, and, yeah. and most generally, if you, you have a personal investment and a personal uh, involvement that's yours, then you do a better job of, of managing. Yeah. I think you're right. Any other questions? I have a question. Just um, you talked to, you talked a bit about leveraging. I'm just wondering. We've heard in, in from other lectures about leveraging and bootstrapping. I'm just <clears throat> wondering what your opinions or your thoughts are about bootstrapping, or you know, how you did it in your business. I'm not. Sh you did a. You did quite a bit of leveraging. It sounds. But just what are your your thoughts on the, those two? Well, basically, I, I really the leveraging was with with partners and and uh, we leveraged a lot in the service station business with the the banks and our our profile and and our uh, business profile was that uh, worst case scenario we could make enough money to pay for the ground that we built the station on or, or we bought an old, older station and converted it. And in, in a growing city, which Phoenix and Arizona has been a very good growth place, the, the ground prices w historically will always go up. Now, we've had a big, big peak uh, that's, that's been unrealistic and the banks got too free with their money and people 
also took the le leveraged the equity in their homes and 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 it just turned out to be a serious mess uh, but I, I I having lived in lived in Brazil has cha changed my attitude about that a whole lot and that is I we lived there. I was a missionary there when it took a suitcase of money to run the mission. And then they devalued the money. I've watched them change the the names of their their currency four four different times, four or five different times in in my life. And they just first they start adding zeros and then they run out of space for zeros and uh, and then they just start all over. And at one time that we were there, the inflation rate was 300 percent. And, I, and I'm going to tell you that after we get through with all of this uh, money from Washington flowing into you so nice and making li life lovely, somebody has to pay the bill. And, and that's going to be largely paid through inflation of the money and devaluation of the, the dollar. now. In, in one, one part of it, fortunately, the world is in the same condition. And so the exchange rate hasn't changed greatly because every, everybody kind of was in this hype. But the time will come when those who have natural resources uh, and backing of natural resources and in, in, in a production manner in which to cover their, their debt or there's going to be inflation and in the countries that don't have that. And we, right now, don't produce enough, and our population is a con and our business is involved in consumer products. Now, that's one of the reasons that I like the idea of, of, of number one, you have to have a place to put a business so we have warehouses. Number two, we're, we're not going to get rid of cars, and so we have gas stations. You eat, you have a restaurant. Uh, we, we just got through zoning a, a garbage uh, or a, a place out in the middle of nowhere where it was surrounded by state land to, be for, to sell for a garbage dump to the, one of the big garbage companies or to the cities. And so those are necessity items. And I think people who are, who are selling Non-necessity items are going to have a really, it's going to be tough. And as far as leverage concerns, why you're, the best place to go leverage today is if you can qualify for an SBA loan because the government's going to give you 30 percent to make the down payment. We, we just, we, last week we met with, a, with two different companies that are building solar generating plants. And and they get they get a 30 percent of their projected costs once they have a once they have the permits they get a 30 percent of their projected costs up front from the government to make the down payment once once and then they when they've got a contract for the electricity then they can go probably to the banks and I, I think that the government will actually force the banks because of the uh, of the green electricity they're going to put out, force, force the banks to lend them the balance of the money to build the, the, plant. the, the plant. And so, plus the, plus the, uh, the engineering fees and, and all of the, if they'll make money on the construction, number one. Number two, they've already got a 30% profit as a gift from the U.S. government. So those kind of things are running about all over right now, and, and it takes some ingenuity and some and get together with some people that technically know what they're doing and the, the one company we talked to are going to put in uh, it, uh, it's going to be a, a five square miles of solar panels wow. and interesting enough uh, the, the technology of that is that they're not using solar they're really not using the solar panels uh, they're using the mirror type that that heat oil and, and follow the sun, and they heat the oil to, to a high temperature, temperature high enough to boil water, then, then they actually run a steam plant. 
And so they can have, some of them are looking for, for properties where you have a natural gas line and the power lines to distribute it. And, and so it takes those places, a place like that to make a good place to go. And they'll make, they'll, they'll make money all, all, all around. And then, then the hot oil, once it's run through the tr and, and makes the steam in the water, then it goes into a holding tank and, and they recirculate it already hot so the solar panels have, are, are way high efficiency because they're heating the oil that just all it did was turn the water into steam and, and the BTUs that it used to do that and have to replace through the solar system. It's already warm. Okay. So, uh, time for one more question I think we had over here. Go ahead. Uh, when you uh, were serving in, with the priests, uh, the priest group, yeah. Uh, you said one of the priests made the comment. Um, um, you want to. He wanted to make enough money, money that money worked for, for him. Yeah. yeah. How have uh, you seen that pan out in your own career? Uh, greatly. If you want to do an interesting little project, go down to the bookstore and buy you one of the and, and forget the computer for a few <laughs> for a little while, and and they'll have an amortization schedule book. Yeah. And if you sit down and run the schedule for amortization of, of, of money at different percent rates or, or the investment compounds. And, and real estate, for example, it compounds tax-free. I mean, it's like having a 401k, only, only, only it's in something that also uh, increases in value not only on the, on the interest side, and particularly if you can put something on the piece of ground that has income. To make the payments, if you, at, at oh several years ago, I d I did a profile, and and if you if you bought a house, and you were paying eight percent interest, okay, and you and and you doubled your payment, how many years do you think it'd take you to pay for the house on, that was a thirty-year mortgage? Oh, that's a good question. Take a guess, all you mathematicians. But it's it, it's a, between seven and eight years. Wow. And 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 you and then then if you if you get the if you then pay pay for that ha pay for that house you pay for you're paying you paid your own house off so then you go buy a, an apartment or or a fourplex or something that you can rent out for enough to bank the payments and continue to make double payments on that. Because you got the same payment as you had on your house right. plus plus the rent, in in a period of between three and five years, you can end up with you at at an eight percent, you end up with four houses paid for, and you can rent them, and w money works for you instead of you working for money. That's a, right. about as simple as, the, of a, as an example as I can give you. Well, our, our time's up, and uh, thanks so much for coming. I mean, you, you highlight, like so many entrepreneurs, I mean, it's interesting, work ethic number one. I mean, you don't get something for nothing. You have to work hard for it. And uh, two, your kind of competitiveness that uh, shown even when you were in high school and, and the fact that you were really good at leveraging relationships. Uh, you know, uh, don't go down paths that uh, other people have already gone down. Learn from them, and you did quite well called plagiarize. Oh, okay. It's the greatest compliment you we can give We don't say a guy. the word at the university, I, plagiarize, you know. I, I but, realize uh, that. <laughs> I realize but that. But I, I told you, you I might, I'd have to watch my language. Yeah, yeah. When I came here. <laughs> no, but you're meaning really use the experience of others, and, and we agree. Right. Well, thanks so much again for coming. Thank All you. All right. Okay.